So in the last few years, we've all seen these marvelous videos of rocket boosters returning on their own to the launch pad. I thought I'd spend a minute explaining what's going on there and why. For decades, we'd launch rockets and the rocket boosters, these are stages of the rocket that are filled entirely with fuel. When they are spent, there's no need for the rest of the rocket system to continue to drag it to its destination. And in the United States, our preeminent launch location is Florida, and we launch east in the same direction that Earth rotates. In that way, we have extra speed endowed by the rotating Earth in order to get to orbit. What are you over after you launch from Florida? You're over the Atlantic Ocean. So you just drop the boosters in the ocean and keep going. It would just be garbage at the bottom of the ocean. Okay, so hang on a sec. Get this. Here we go. The actual space shuttle system doesn't have a stick coming out its butt here. Ignore this, okay? <laughs> so, back when we launched the space shuttle, notice there are three fuel tanks. These are the solid rocket boosters, the one on the side. That's solid fuel. When it ignites, this thing takes off. The big tank has liquid fuel that you can throttle. The large tank grants you the control you want accessing orbit. The solid rocket boosters get you off the ground. I mean, all three engines will do that, but liquid fuel, is actually turned on before the count gets to zero. That's the first set of flames you see, but nothing's going anywhere yet until the solid rocket boosters kick in. These were, in fact, recycled. They were hauled out of the ocean and dragged back to Utah where they were made, and they're refilled with the next round of solid rocket fuel. So those were reused, but not with the spectacular sight of them returning to the launch pad. All right, so here's what's going on. What SpaceX has done is rather than exhaust the booster and have it drop into the ocean, we have to ship it out of the water. The booster has leftover fuel. The booster is launched with fuel that is not used during the launch. That fuel has weight, by the way. Not only that, the boosters have tripods that unfold, enabling it to land solidly on the surface that you choose. And it has whatever avionics and whatever GPS system so that wherever it detaches from the main engine, it can find its way back to the pad. You don't have a person there with a joystick doing that. Computers do this. We can ask, what is the weight of the extra fuel? What is the weight of the tripod? That's weight that could have been used for the payload, but it's not. So anytime you're going to return a booster back to the launch pad, you are forfeiting some amount of weight of what would otherwise go in the fairing of your rocket. And the fairing is the nose section that contains whatever it is you're launching into space. That's an interesting trade-off. If the access to space is so cheap and you need to put more payload, then you just launch another rocket. If it's that cheap, you just do it that way. Nothing wrong with that. So now here's a couple of interesting facts. The Europa Clipper mission, the spacecraft that's going to Jupiter, orbit Jupiter and take these loops that come close to the surface of Jupiter's moon Europa to look for life, especially beneath the surface. They have certain ice penetrating radar because beneath that icy surface, is an ocean of liquid water. There's more liquid water on Europa than there is in the oceans of the Earth. And as far as we can determine, life on Earth began in our oceans. Anyhow, that spacecraft was so heavy that the boosters could not afford the extra fuel and the tripod. So those two rocket boosters did not come back. They gave their lives for science. But if you look at their launch record, they each had been used many times before. What better way to retire them than to put them on their last mission, which will take a space probe to Jupiter and then descend into the Atlantic. If I gotta go out, take me out that way. So the value of reusing rocket parts cannot be overstated. If you were to fly on a 747 from the United States to Europe, and every time you did that, they took the plane and shoved it off a cliff and rolled out a brand new one, your cost of flying to Europe would be thousands of times higher every time you did it. 
possibly even more. You'd be paying millions of dollars to fly to Europe every time. But we reuse the airplane. Yeah, in between, the engineers check it out. They kick the tire. They make sure everything's working. You have a, a, a diagnostic list to make sure that everything checks out. You put it back in motion. So not only do you want to reuse the parts, you want to fly them as often as you possibly can. Because as is true with most businesses, there's the cost of the mission itself, but then there's the cost of the sort of the marching army. There's like everybody who's just staffed to make it all happen at all times. That's a constant. So the more launches you have in a year, then you get to divide out some of those fixed costs and then the cost per mission drops as a result. I'm amazed I can even have this conversation now because in the 1960s and 70s and 80s and 90s, none of this was a consideration. Well, it sort of was with the space shuttle. Space shuttle says, let's reuse the orbiter. That's the thing that looks like a stubby airplane. And it was reused, but it turned out to be really expensive to sort of short back up to usability between launches. If we were able to use the space shuttle weekly, for example, that would have cut into the overall cost of maintaining the program. And it might have been economical at some point, but it never turned out that way. So it was a start. I applaud the effort to try to make it an affordable thing. But as is so often the case, government will do something first and then private enterprise looks over your shoulder and say, oh, how did you do that? And what are the patents? And uh, did it work? What didn't work? And they'll take notes and then they'll do it and they'll work on it and do it either better or cheaper or both. So the future of space, of the routine things we do in space, that future is surely the purview of private industry, which when you think about it, it could have happened decades ago, but the system wasn't sort of designed for that. And it took acts of Congress to try to make sure that at least some of the money was deeply invested in private enterprises so that they can participate in the way that they have. And just to be clear, NASA has always used private enterprise for its space activities. In the day, Lockheed, Martin Marinetta, Boeing, Grumman. So all these companies assisted NASA, but NASA led that effort. NASA said, we need this, build it to our specs, and that's what they did. The future, is private enterprise say they want to accomplish certain tasks. And then the government says, oh, can we hitch a ride on that? Or can we use one of your rockets? Can you help us out? So that's the future. If we want the solar system to be our backyard, which I kind of want. I mean, why not? We're sitting here in a cave. What is a cave to the rest of the world? It's this little place where you feel safe and things are probably dangerous outside, but they're probably great other things to know. And if you stay in the cave, you'll think you're safe. You think you're in a good situation, but you have no idea how far you can go. Literally, figuratively, emotionally, and intellectually. So, welcome to the Space Frontier, brought to you by a spate of commercial efforts that are transitioning what in its day was a space program into a space industry. And that's what's up with that. Till next time, keep looking up. Every few months, a new headline warns of an asteroid on a collision course with Earth. But how real is the risk? You'll find somewhat reliable sources emphasizing the asteroid's magnitude and which countries might be spared. While other highly credible sources reassure us there's a 98% chance we'll be fine. Exaggerated language, selective framing and misleading urgency make it easy for science reporting to veer into sensationalism. The result? More clicks, more panic and less actual understanding. And that's what makes our partners at Ground News so different. They're an independent app and website founded by a former NASA engineer who brought the same level of precision she needed up in space to how we consume information here on Earth. I can compare coverage from NASA, Nature and more with data on each outlet's biases and credibility. I can even see which stories might be missing from my media bubble to ensure I'm forming conclusions based on the full picture. And if I really want a deeper dive in no time at all, their daily briefings analyse the dozens of sources covering this issue for us. Ground News breaks down the facts 
what every outlet can agree on, as well as the different narratives shaping the public's perspective. Best of all, StarTalk viewers can get the same top-tier Vantage plan we use for nearly half the price. That's just $5 a month for understanding shaped by clarity and credibility, not clickbait. So head to ground.news slash StarTalk or scan the QR code to subscribe today. <laughs>